Hello everybody, welcome back to Kerbal Space Program. The journey continues. We start with just a, a very quick mission, as I mentioned towards the end of the last episode. We need to go and fetch those astronauts that are currently aboard our interplanetary craft, the Ptolemy, and bring them back home. And we're just going to leave the Ptolemy where it is for the moment. It's uh, it's fine where it is, and it's all fueled and ready and waiting to go. We, uh, we just need to send up a crew and uh, send it on its way when the moment arrives. This is just a basic housekeeping mission, so uh, we're going to breeze through this one fairly quickly. So before too long we're in orbit and from there we can start planning and performing the various manoeuvres that will uh, take us up to the Ptolemy that's orbiting about half a million metres above Kerbin. We're using my Mark II shuttle for this one. Uh, the Mark III shuttle is a little bit of overkill, plus it doesn't really have the manoeuvring range to get up to, uh, to this orbital altitude. I mean, I suppose whilst we're on the subject, I could have used my Brunel, uh, my Brunel vehicle as well, but uh, that doesn't have the crew capacity. We'd have had to have done something pretty convoluted to get all the crew back home. Uh, and the Mark II shuttle is is more than capable of doing the job. It uh, can get up to uh, can get up to orbit at this uh, this height without any trouble. And uh, on this mission, makes it back into the atmosphere with about half its fuel remaining. So, without even breaking into a sweat, really. Once we arrive at the Ptolemy, we bring the shuttle into dock, and uh, then it's a fairly easy task just to transfer most of the crew across. I say most of the crew because we're leaving Kurdard on the craft for the moment. Because we're uh, leaving the Ptolemy empty, and because there's no remote guidance unit or similar on it, that means that uh, there won't be any stability assist active on the craft once we leave it. So what we really want to avoid is giving the Ptolemy a nudge, say from undocking, without any crew aboard, because that's just going to set it spinning. Um, it won't be very fast, but it's still going to make it a bit of a pain in the backside to come and dock with it in future. So then we undock the shuttle from the Ptolemy, uh, and once I'm happy that it's not wobbling or moving anymore, we spacewalk Kurdard across. So with all that done and the Ptolemy safe and secure in orbit, it's time for our astronauts to make their way home. Now last time I tried to return with this Mark II shuttle, uh, I had a little bit of difficulty. We ended up coming up far too short, and this time I thought I'd remembered the correct procedure for my Mark II shuttle, but uh, turns out not so much. Instead of it coming up far too short, we actually overshoot by a fair bit. Not too much, I do manage to get the thing turned around, and eventually we do land back safely on the runway. So, uh, well, at least we're getting closer. So now on to the meat and potatoes of today's episode, and to that end we are blasting off from the KSC once again with one of my Mark II shuttles, but uh, this time we've swapped out the crew transport variant for, uh, for my light cargo version. After Jebediah and Bill were in command of the last mission, we're in the safe hands of Valentina and Bob for this one, and uh, their task today is a relatively simple one. They've just got to get up into orbit and drop off a little payload, and uh, that payload is the interesting bit, but... Uh, I might be getting ahead of myself a little bit here. Once our Kerbals are in low curb in orbit, uh, just like in the last mission, we raise our altitude up to about 500 kilometers and then circularize. Whilst last time this maneuver was all about performing an orbital rendezvous, this time our cargo is going to go off and do its own thing, so we want to give it as much energy as is possible from the fuel tanks of the shuttle. In the cargo bay today, we have an example of a stock technology that we uh, we haven't yet used in this playthrough, and I'm talking, of course, about ion engines. We've built ourselves a little ion-powered probe, and uh, we're going to send it on a little excursion around the Kerbin system, just as a little test. So having unfurled the solar panels and uh, powered up the engine, we perform a little bit of a test burn, just to, just to make sure everything's within working order. We push our apoapsis up to about 550 kilometers. With everything looking good so far, it's time for Valentina and Bob to close those cargo bay doors and start making their way back to Kerbin. Once again, this approach is an improvement on the last one. Uh, we do come up a little bit short, but uh, with just a kick from our engines, we get enough extra energy and uh, we do manage to make it back to the KSC. Back in orbit and we are ready to start, uh, to start some more serious testing of this ion probe. Our first job is going to be to lift this probe's orbit up to about 2,000 kilometers. Now for these ion engines to work, I will need light on the solar panel, so we can't do any manoeuvring in the shadow of Kerbin. To that end, I'm performing my engine burns roughly in line with Kerbin's Terminator, that day-night line, and also to keep my, uh, to keep my periapsis and apoapsis roughly in those positions as well. That means that whenever we're performing our manoeuvres at uh, apoapsis and periapsis, we always have line of sight to Kerbin Star Kerbal, and hence always have power. Now this takes a while. Um, for those of you who are unfamiliar with ion engines and the science behind them, 
An ion is an atom or molecule that has an imbalance of protons and electrons, and therefore has some overall electrostatic charge, and because of that, can be attracted or repelled by other electrostatic charges. Without going into the technical details, you can use this property of ions to fire them out the back of a spacecraft at phenomenal speeds, giving you thrust with unbelievably high fuel efficiency. Now, almost inevitably, there's some kind of trade-off here, and the trade-off is that whilst your thrust is incredibly high efficiency, the thrust itself is incredibly low. Now, compared to their real-life counterparts, the ion engines in KSP aren't quite as extreme. They've had their, uh, their fuel efficiency dialed down quite a lot, and their thrust dialed up quite a lot, but they still represent that end of the spectrum. So going anywhere with ion engines takes you a very long time, but eventually we get there, we get to our 2000 km orbit. Now, we're not stopping here. Our ultimate goal is to take this probe on a flyby of the moon. Now, had we done that as a single manoeuvre from low Kerbin orbit, it would have raised a couple of issues. First of all, the burn itself would have just taken an age. Also, we're orbiting Kerbin a little too fast. That would have played havoc with the manoeuvre. But uh, by raising its orbit up to about 2,000 kilometres, we've given it a lot of energy. The burn itself won't take too long. And we're orbiting Kerbin at a sensible pace for that burn to take place. Now, this is not the most fuel efficient way to do a transfer to the moon. But we're using ion engines. And even with just a single tank of fuel, I have so much delta V that that's basically a non-issue. Having completed our main burn and a little correction burn, it's not too long before the moon looms large and we can begin our flyby in earnest. I do enjoy doing these little flybys in KSP. Uh, you get some great shots and there's not much for you to do apart from sit back and enjoy the scenery. There was a moment of worry during this particular fly past. Uh, we're quite low down close to the moon and there was a mountain range approaching us at an uncomfortable speed, but in the end we do manage to clear it with plenty of room to spare, and before too long we're out the other side and heading for home. I say heading for home, uh, as the eagle-eyed of you will have noticed, this probe is on a collision course with Kerbin, and uh, we're not going to do anything to stop it. As I said earlier, this was just a quick test really, we're not going to use this probe for anything else, and we don't want to have space junk lying about, so uh, its return to Kerbin will be a very final one. There were a couple of reasons for doing this, just as a simple test. Uh, first of all, it kind of fits narratively. Uh, second of all, it was sort of a test for myself as well. I just wanted to see whether there had been any, any massive changes between 1.4 and 1.7, but uh, no, everything looks to be as it was, so we're all good and ready to go for the main mission. Just before we get to that, though, we'll watch this craft's demise. Uh, it enters the atmosphere at about 3 kilometers per second. The solar panels don't last very long, and uh, shortly after that, the rest of the craft is promptly vaporised. So here we go with today's primary mission, also today's penultimate mission. I mean, whilst this is kind of like the main objective for this episode, there's something else we kind of need to get started on sooner rather than later, so I'll be doing the first mission of that as the last thing on this episode. We've made the switch to our Mark III shuttle, the Mark II shuttle just would not cut it for this one, and uh, aboard we have all four of our orange suits. We have Jebediah, Bill, Bob and Valentina. The crew of the Ptolemy are still resting up a bit, but uh, they'll be back in action soon enough. I've had to make some changes for this launch. Uh, whilst our cargo is quite long, it's not particularly heavy, nowhere near the lifting capability of this shuttle, and that made things a little bit unbalanced, so I've uh, I've had to turn off the uh, the dorsal engine of the shuttle's main three engines just to keep things balanced and the uh, the vectoring on those engines can make up for the rest. Once we get ourselves a nice circular low Kerbin orbit, it's time for us to push that up to about 200 kilometers. Again, we're giving our payload just a little bit of a boost. It's not quite as crucial this time around, but uh, I thought I'd do it nonetheless. It's kind of a theme on this mission. I've managed to stupidly over-engineer just about everything. Um, even as soon as I'd launched, I was thinking, yeah, I probably could have taken that out. And that out. And that out as well. But um, I can foresee some problems we might run into because of that. But, uh, you know, we'll, uh, we'll cross that bridge when we get to it. So once we've circularised that orbit and brought ourselves into the sunlight so we can see what's going on, it's time to deploy our rather odd-looking cargo. Now, this is an ion engine science probe with a nuclear-powered booster stage on it. And uh, once it's clear of the cargo bay, we deploy the solar panels, we get it pointing in the right direction, and it is good to go. But uh, first of all, our Kerbals, their mission complete, can make their way back to the KSC. Nothing much to report on the journey home. We uh, perform our deorbit burn, we get a good approach, we get a good landing on the runway, and 
At this point, I'm thinking to myself, yeah, I've got these Mark III shuttle landings pretty much nailed down. Yeah, we'll, uh, we'll see about that. Back in orbit, and we are ready to start making plans for our science probe. Now, whilst the Ptolemy, and spoiler alert, any similar vehicle can easily reach Eve, Juna, and Drez, Moho is kind of the standout absentee from that list. It's the other one of the five inner rocky planets, and uh, none of our vehicles have the Delta V requirements to do a manned mission, at least not for the time being. However, for an ion-powered probe and its nuclear-powered booster stage, it's a doddle, so we begin planning our transfer burn to Moho. Once again, for this, I'm using Alex Moon's transfer calculator. Uh, I'll put a link in the description, and uh, it's a little tool that I cannot recommend highly enough. So with our manoeuvre planned, it's time for us to perform our burn. And there's a couple of difficulties here. The first is that I'm using a probe core without manoeuvre node tracking, uh, just to cut down on some weight. And uh, this isn't a huge problem. We can just uh, line it up manually, but it's far from ideal. The second is that the burn time indicator decides it's going to take a quick holiday and not tell us when we should burn. I have to guess it, and as it turns out, I start burning a little too late. But eventually we complete our burn and I go to check our encounter with Moho, and uh, what do you know, it's not there. Obviously all those little errors have accumulated, uh, leading to us missing our encounter. Uh, Moho's relatively high inclination orbit does mean the margins are incredibly fine here, so we need to perform a course correction pretty much straight away, and my god, planning this one takes an age. I spend so long just fiddling with the parameters of this manoeuvre, and I do this in the full knowledge that when I actually come to make the burn, that's not going to be perfect, and we're not going to get an encounter that good. Fortunately for you, I can just cut most of this out. Finally, we get a good encounter with Moho. I perform the burn, and no, it isn't perfect, but the result is more than good enough. With all that done, our probe separates from its booster, and it is off on its journey. Now, this booster stage is escaping into interplanetary space, but uh, we don't want to create any unnecessary space junk, and this thing has got a lot of spare Delta V for a very good reason, so we get it turned round, pointing pretty much straight at Kerbin, and we fire that engine. We get a good collision course with Kerbin, and then we leave our booster to its fate. Uh, now, I didn't put any radiators on this stage. Uh, I thought we wouldn't need it, and in the end we didn't, but this particular burn kind of goes close to the margins. By the time I'm finished, parts of the craft other than the engine are starting to glow red hot. So yeah, cutting it a little fine, but we were all good in the end. So with our booster stage now a cloud of smoke in Kerbin's atmosphere, it's time to turn our attention back to this probe. There's not a lot else to do. I'll probably perform another course correction at a later date, see if we can... Uh, get our encounter a little closer, maybe even when we get right close to it, see if we can bleed off a little speed. But for now, this is how we're going to leave things. I do need to extend the antenna because we're just getting out of the radio range of that little drone core. But uh, apart from that, that's all that needs to be done for the time being. So now for one final time this episode, we are blasting off from the KSC, this time again with our Mark III shuttle. Our test crew of the Ptolemy is fully rested, and so Tommel, Bargel, Johnny, and Curdard will be taking us through this one. Once again, the payload is pretty light, so once again we have to resort to the trick of shutting down the, uh, the shuttle's dorsal engine. Our destination with this mission is the space station. Uh, between recordings I've gone up and I've made sure that everything on the space station that needs its monopropellant refilling is refilled from the station's central tank. And then when we get up there, we can just refill that quite easily from the shuttle's tank. The shuttle carries tons of spare monopropellant, so that's not going to be a problem, but uh, that's not the main focus of today's mission. In the near future, we want to send missions off to Eve, uh, back to Juna to explore its moon Ike, and uh, to Drez. Now, the Drez transfer windows are pretty regular. They come about roughly once a year, but the, uh, the transfer windows to Eve and Juna are a little bit more problematic, and we've got both of them coming up pretty soon. And we want to send off a mission on both of these, so we are going to need another interplanetary vehicle. And apologies for doing the obvious and boring thing here, but we are going to make ourselves a copy of the Ptolemy. We're going to build ourselves another Ptolemy-class interplanetary ship. There'll be some minor differences between the two craft. Uh, I think a major difference is that we won't be sending this one off with a lander to begin with. Um, but um, yeah, more on that at a later date. So our first mission in the construction of this new vehicle is to send up the Command and Habitation module and dock that to the space station, pretty much where the Ptolemy was previously. 
So having arrived, docked and refueled that, uh, that monopropellant tank, it's time for us to transfer our payload over to the space station. For this we use one of these space tugs that I delivered to the space station in a previous episode, and that's just going to very gently take that module out of the shuttle's cargo bay and manoeuvre it around to that docking port on the side of the space station science lab. With that we redock our space tug, we replace the little bit of fuel it's used from the shuttle, and then it is time for us to depart. So for one final time this episode, our astronauts say farewell to the void of space and make their way back down into Kerbin's atmosphere. Now, as I kind of alluded to earlier in the episode, this landing doesn't go quite according to plan. Uh, I don't bleed off enough energy early enough, and um, by the time I get to the runway, my piloting ability abandons me, and yeah, it's not, it's not my finest moment. But we're down, we're down on the runway, and we're down in one piece, so how bad can it be, really? Anyway, that will bring an end to today's episode. I do hope you've enjoyed it, everybody. Next episode's going to be something a little bit different, but uh, for now, thanks for watching, take care, and I'll see you next time.